Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Discover what's possible when people impacted by autism inspire change and build community. Together with the Global Autism Project, here's your host, Rachel Harmon. Hello, everyone. While today's guest needs no introduction, I'll do my best to summarize her long list of accolades and outline the key points of our conversation. Dr. Temple Grandin is well known for both her pioneer work as an autism advocate and her lifelong dedication to animal welfare. Through groundbreaking research aimed at understanding her own autistic mind, Dr. Grandin propelled the awareness of autism during a time when very little was known of it. She's an incredible source of hope for children with autism, their parents, and anyone with a dream. Dr. Grandin became an internationally recognized leader in animal handling innovations after developing a corral that improved the quality of life of cattle by reducing stress. She's consulted with the USDA and major corporations such as McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, Whole Foods, and Chipotle. Today, Half of the cattle in North America are handled in facilities she designed. Dr. Grandin is also a prominent author, having written several books on autism and animal behavior. She's been featured on various media outlets and programs, including NPR, BBC, Larry King Live, 2020, 60 Minutes, and TED, to name a few. In 2010, HBO produced an Emmy Award winning movie about her life. And later that year, she was highlighted in Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. In 2016, she was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. These days, Dr. Grandin continues to write and teaches animal science at Colorado State University. In this conversation, Dr. Grandin explains how her ability to think in pictures helped her to empathize with animals in the early days of her career. She also shares why she thinks the world needs different brains to work together. Dr. Grandin talks about the future of cattle and the dangers of genetic modification in animals and humans. We discuss how to increase employment for autistic adults, how to promote curiosity among children, and how to stay balanced during the COVID-19 pandemic. Other topics we cover include the classification of autism under a single umbrella, the neurodiversity movement, ABA therapy, and teaching autism awareness in schools. Listen until the end of the conversation to hear Dr. Grandin's advice for autistic self-advocates. In this episode, discover what's possible when different brains come together. We appreciate your time. If you enjoy this podcast and you'd like to support our mission, please take just a few seconds to share it with one person who you think will find value in it too. You can also follow us on Instagram at Autism Podcast and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Global Autism Project. We would love to hear your feedback about the show. Please fill out the short survey in our show notes to let us know your thoughts. For more information about Dr. Grandin and her work, please visit our show notes at autismknowsnoborders.com. And now I present you Dr. Temple Grandin. Hi, Temple. Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Thank you for being here today. It's great to be here by um, video today. Could you please briefly introduce yourself? Well, my name is Temple Grandin. I'm a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. Been there a long time. Came out to Colorado in 1990. My specialty is animal behavior, animal welfare. I work with a lot of companies on improving uh, their animal welfare and done a lot of research on livestock behavior. Yeah. I'd like to start with talking about the way your brain works. Well, I'm an absolute visual thinker. Everything I think about is a picture. And if you look at the HBO movie, Temple Grandin, it shows exactly how I think. You know, it's pictures. You know, if you ask me, as you go grocery shopping today, I'm seeing the two supermarkets I go to. Mm -hmm. You see, it's not in words. It's in pictures. You know, now I've still got the supermarkets on my mind. Now I'm walking around in them now. I'm kind of switching back and forth between the two of them. Looked at some oranges uh, just the other day. I thought they didn't look very nice. So I'm going to go to the other market to buy them. 
And I'm just seeing that right now. Just a real simple example. Yeah. So could you describe your thinking pattern? Like if a thought comes into your head. Well, why don't you ask me something more specific than a thought coming into my head? Because then I start seeing like cartoons and they have a little bubble of a writing over the person's head. Mm -hmm. See that. Okay. So you take the word that you're hearing and then you match a picture to it. Well, yeah. And then you see a word like the, I just see it like written with a Sharpie on a piece of paper Mm -hmm. because it doesn't really have any meaning. It's just, I call it a filler word. You just put it in there for the grammar. Yeah. And how about if you're thinking of a story, like a sequence, does it play out like a video for you? Yeah. I, I, I play it like a video. I don't handle sequence all that well. In fact, if I, you know, let's say I had a job at a restaurant and I got to take some equipment apart and wash it and put it back together again. When I first started, make myself a checklist of the order of the events. I just write down a little checklist, sort of like a pilot's checklist for, um, you know, take this equipment apart, clean it, put it back together again. Because I'm not a verbal person at all. But being a visual person, is uh, really a benefit for work with animals because animals are sensory-based thinkers. They're not word-based thinkers. They live in a sensory-based world. So if you want to understand an animal, you've got to get away from verbal language. Now, when I was young, I thought everybody thought in pictures. I didn't know that I thought differently. I thought everybody thought the way I did. I wasn't until I got in my 30s that I got any inkling that other people did not think in pictures. What made you realize Well, I was at a conference and I got talking to speech therapists and I got to talking about how we think. Now, if I say to most people, think about your own home or think about the office where you work, you're so familiar with that. Most people will see that visually. But when I ask you something you don't own, but it's out there in the environment, most people don't pay that much attention to it, like church steeples. When you ask me that question, I see specific ones. I start naming them off. I asked the speech therapist, and she just did the most vague, vague, vague. I'll show you what she did. She did a very vague thing like this. For her, a church steeple was just this, where for me, I'm seeing the different churches. Mm -hmm. So I just want to describe what you drew for people who are listening to it and don't see the video. Well, what I drew was just a, a, a steep triangle with two black lines. Mm -hmm. pointy thing she said and it was very vague and then there's degrees of visual thinking you'll get some people will they'll they'll see something more detailed but they don't identify it the visual thinker will usually start naming off the churches or just start naming off where they're at and they come up into their mind like a series of powerpoint slides Mm -hmm. but people can be kind of a mix right yeah, yeah, people can be a mix. In fact, most people are kind of a mix. But then you get some people with uh, that are autistic or some people are just really mathematical. Um, you get extremes. In fact, there's been research on what's called an object visualizer and a uh, visual spatial. Now, an object visualizer is how I think in specific pictures. The visual spatial, that's more the mathematical mind. In fact, I've written about that in my book, The Autistic Brain. I've covered some of the research. That book was published in 2013. And now there's been a lot more research on on object visualization and visual spatial. They are two different things. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes researchers mix them together and they should not be mixed together. And so that kind of messes up a lot of studies. But that's actually based in science. And when you have them in the extreme, they're kind of opposite skills. You're not going to find an extreme object visualizer in the same person that's like a super, super good mathematician. Hmm, interesting. And what are some ways that these different brains can work together? Well, let's take something simple like interfaces, you know, like Zoom, for example. One of the reasons why Zoom got all the business is I didn't have to have a degree in engineering to use Zoom. It was easy to use. In fact, I read about the history of Zoom. The original founder worked for another company, and he wanted to upgrade the interface, and they didn't want to do it. And uh, now I've noticed that when I go to the other platforms, they're all copying Zoom now. And sometimes I forget which one I'm on. You know, it's just a (laughs) slight difference in the icons and things like that, you know, down on the bottom. But 
you see the object visualizer would make the interface easy to use. Now all the code that programming is done by the mathematical mind, by the visual spatial. So you need the two together. Mm -hmm. Let's look at something like the iPhone. Steve Jobs was an artist. That's why it's easy to use. The programmers had to make the phone actually work. So these are places where the two different kinds of minds can complement. They have complementary skills. Because when the programmers design the interfaces, they usually put too many features on it. It's too complicated, and nobody can figure out how to use it. Mm -hmm. So Temple, you mentioned that your ability to think in pictures helped you empathize with the experience of animals. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, it's easier to imagine what something would be like for an animal. The very, very first work I ever did with cattle was out in the Arizona feedlots. And I went around to all these different feedlots and I handled cattle going through the uh, raceways for vaccinations. And I noticed they would stop at a shadow. They'd stop at a coat on a fence. They'd see a reflection off a vehicle bumper. Things that we tend to not notice, those animals were noticing. Nobody else noticed this. And at this time, when I was in my 20s, I thought everybody thought in pictures. I didn't realize that my thinking was different. And, you know, it was, it was just totally obvious to me what they were seeing. And nobody else was doing that at the time. Mm -hmm. And I know that you've done a lot of work to kind of revolutionize the meat industry. And I'm wondering, as an expert on animal behavior and humane livestock handling, have you ever thought about becoming vegan? No. Uh, first of all, if I don't have a certain amount of animal protein, I simply can't function. And I think there are genetic differences. I actually tried going on a vegan diet eons ago. I, I all get all lightheaded. I cannot function. Also, it's done a lot of thinking about you know, our use of animals. I feel very strongly we've got to give animals a life worth living, a really good life. The other thing is looking at some of the environmental concerns with livestock. I've done a lot of looking into things like crop rotation. And when you use grazing animals in, in crop rotation, it actually improves the land. We have huge amounts of land all around the world where the only way you can raise food on it is grazing animals. And a really good example is the outback of Australia. And you don't realize how vast that is until you fly over it in a small airplane. I had a chance to do that just three or four years ago. And you go look at all this land and you're flying on this plane and you, there's nothing. There's no houses, no electrical wires, no nothing. And then there in the middle of nowhere, there's a cattle station. And we land on a dirt strip. It has their own generator. I'm completely off the grid. And I look at this, and if you do this carefully, you're raising food in a very sustainable manner. You're not going to crop this land. You don't have enough water in the ground to crop the land. And animals, when they're used really right, can improve the soil health. And you use them wrong, they wreck pasture. I want to emphasize they got to be used right. The other thing I learned from an agronomist, and this is why it's important to go across disciplines, I want to commend our animal science department at Colorado State. This was about three years ago. They invited an agronomist to come to our animal science seminar. And it was one of the few times I wasn't out of town and I was there. And I learned from this agronomist that the very best cropland in the US, the very best that we have, Iowa and Illinois, was created by herds of grazing bison. It's a grazing animal. They created some of the best cropland that we have. Yeah, we need getting the livestock back on the land. And I've been, I'm not an expert in this area, but I'm just doing enough on it to learn. I've read a lot of scientific articles on it that um, this is the way to go. Now I want to emphasize, it's very local. A grazing rotation or crop rotation that would work in one part of the US or maybe work in one part of Europe will not work somewhere else. It's very, very local. I can't emphasize enough. You have to get local advice on what crops to use. That's really interesting and something I know nothing about. <laughs> well, I didn't knew very little about it until about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I've been around for a long time. I'm, I'm 73 years old, so I've been in the industry pushing 50 years. But I really started getting interested in this because we've got to do things that improve the, the land and improve sustainability. We've got to do that. And when you look at some of these vegan products, you've got a big supply chain with a lot of different complicated ingredients on it. Each one of those has to be transported by trucks, by rail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And I don't think the full life cycle of some of those products has been completely figured out. Right. So with more and more companies selling laboratory produced meat, what do you think will happen to the future of cattle? Well, I think it's going to be a place for the grazing animal because there's a lot of, uh, or sheep and goats. I'm, I'm going to put all the grazing animals together because they can utilize land for food that you can't utilize any other way. And they do it very efficiently. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. All right, Temple, I want to talk about your autism and how that affects you. You know, when you were starting your career, what sorts of challenges did you face as an autistic woman? Well, I started my career in the 70s, in the early 70s. Being a woman in a man's industry in Arizona was a much bigger barrier than autism ever was. Much, much bigger barrier. I had to be three times better than a guy. I had to make myself really good at what I did. And the first thing I did is I became a very good livestock editor for the Arizona Farm and Ranchman magazine. And there's a scene in the movie where I get the editor's card. And I realized that if I wrote for that magazine, it would help my career. See, a lot of people don't, you know, there'll be an opportunity to do that and they miss up on that opportunity. But make myself good at what I did. And a lot of people thought I was stupid and wouldn't amount to anything. So I had a huge motivation, prove I wasn't stupid. And the thing I liked in the movie is all the projects are accurate. And they actually recreated the dipping vat system that I worked on designing in the mid 70s. And I really liked that part of it. The other thing is I've worked on a lot of big construction projects. I spent about 25 years out on jobs. I, I would sell a job, do the drawings, you know, then design it supervised construction. And there are a lot of people that would be in special ed today that were super good welders that could build anything, machinery designers, drafting, lay out entire plants, lay out entire factories. And they were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. I am saying that seriously, about 20%. When I look back, you see, the other problem you got with autism is it's such a big range. I mean, half the programmers in Silicon Valley that bring us the tech we're talking on right now and those fancy headphones you've got on right there, where do you think that stuff came from? That doesn't come from the social yakety X. Mm-hmm. It comes from a brain that thinks social chit chat's boring and would rather design fancy headphones. Yeah, I think you put in your book, your book, Thinking in Pictures, My Life with Autism, you wrote something about if it weren't for autistic people, we would all still be living in caves. Well, oh, that's right. And the other thing is I got thinking in pictures right here. I'll hold it up for the YouTube people. But the other thing in thinking in pictures, I've got copies of my drawings. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, what I learned to do a long time ago is to sell my work. Now, my idea of an interview was to lay the drawings out there on the table, pictures of jobs. Just show the work. That's what I did. Mm-hmm. How does your autism affect your life now? In the movie, I noticed that you were dealing with a lot of sensory issues. Are those things still coming up for you now? My sensory issues are now mild compared to a lot of people's sensory issues. But my number one research priority for autism would be how to deal with some of the very severe sensory issues that make um, you know some noise painful. Uh, just get too much. It, it makes it painful to, to live. It would be my top priority to work on some, of, on some of those things. Now, what's happened to me, the thing that I find helps is every morning I get up early, I have breakfast, I sit and read for a while, then I get uh, dressed and I'm dressed for work now at seven o'clock in the morning, no slouching around in jammies. Get up every day, get on a schedule, do writing in the morning. I do book a lot of conferences in the afternoon lots of times, you know, since you were in Europe, I did this one in the morning, my time. Mm-hmm. Then I've been like lining up writing projects. I got to have stuff to do. Right. Yeah. Well, all my travel's been canceled since March. It suddenly canceled. Um, well, January canceled. They just canceled our, our big um, Denver stock show just got canceled. They just canceled a whole pile of a gigantic veterinary meeting, a cattle meeting, Gigantic international food show just got canceled, completely canceled. And the other two events got moved to the summer. So I've been home a whole lot. I'm working on a new book on visual thinking. And I've got other writing projects I've lined up to do. I'm a big fan of using um, 
video conferencing. Mm-hmm. You know, one thing that's good thing that's happened is I'm talking to you now in another country. Yeah, you see, there was less of that before. They'd want me to come to the country, and there was just no way I could. In fact, I was doing two or three different airports every week, and I think after COVID gets over with, when we get a vaccine, and we're going to have to distribute those vaccines. <laughs> my chain management. I've already been thinking about that. So, do you still find yourself needing to use the hugging machine? No, I haven't used that for 10 years. It broke. I didn't get around to fixing it. Then I was hugging lots of real people when I went to all these conferences. Now we're not allowed to do that. So now I just have to do pretend air hugs. <laughs> something that I really don't want to do. Mm-hmm. But it, overnight, it just changed everybody's lives. Yeah. I, what I recommend to people is get on a schedule. And I suggest for some of the kids that are having a hard time to look up life on the International Space Station. And I just watched the new SpaceX launch, four more astronauts on the station. I think they got seven people on that station now. You have seven people in a very tight quarters. Like uh, if you look where they're sleeping, they have like sleeping bags. They get into their way, you know, they're vertical, but they're actually way. Yeah. And they're right next to you. You know, one guy's making some noise in the middle of the night. The others are going to hear it. Uh, Close quarters. And one of the things they've learned is they've got to be on a schedule. They wake up in the morning. You know, you can't just lay around. You wake up in the morning. Then you've got your chores. You've got, um, you know, maintenance chores. You've got your experiments you got to do. Then everybody gets together for the midday meal. I actually looked at a space station, actual real schedule for it. And the midday meal is a big banner across the schedule. Everybody has to be at the midday meal. Then you have the exercise schedule. And you have to do a lot of it. Mm-hmm. And then they have time off. They learn they had to have some time off just to do what they wanted. And they've collected over the years, you know, video games, movies, books, even in board games, they've got some musical instruments up there. Yeah. I think that's something we're all learning to do right now, working from home, just creating schedules and sticking to them. Cause it's really easy to get distracted. At least this is what I find. Well, this is the problem. And, and I just talked to a second grade teacher, that would be a teacher that teaches seven-year-old children a regular school, and half her kids are not logging on to the online classes. It's just awful. They're just dropping out. Mm -hmm. And that's totally terrible. I mean, the priority should be getting the little ones back to school. That's where the priority needs to be. Yeah, in a safe way. It's hard, I think, with the confinement, like my husband and I were talking about how we feel that our attention span is shorter because we're not seeing far out these days. We're locked inside rooms and we're trying to make it a point to go on routine walks so we can see further out in the distance. That's the space station approach. Have one midday meal, then you schedule a time for your walk and schedule some time for some free time. Because the mistake they made in the beginning is on on the original Skylab is they overworked them and they got mad. And in Russia, they learned the same thing on their space agency. They went through the same stuff. And then you got the people living in the Arctic uh, stations. Mm. You you know, you got to have a schedule where you have together time scheduled. You have your work time. uh, Then you also have some free time Mm -hmm. where they can look out the window. They can play a video game, watch a movie. Oh, talk about looking out into space. (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah, and they have a cupola. They have a place to do that. But then again, now you get seven people on that station. They're going to take turns with that window. And they have three exercise machines, three different types. They have to be scheduled, and they have to do a lot of exercise. They're going to be up there for six months. And if they don't do a lot of exercise, it will really mess up their health. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Temple, I'd like to talk about employment and I'm curious of what some of your ideas are to increase the rate of employment for adults with autism. First of all, we've got two groups here. We got ones where no preparation was done. All right, let's first of all talk about the ones that are in the pipeline now. Maybe the kid's 10. Mm -hmm. Well, he should have had chores. Got to start learning how to do tasks. When they get to be around 11 years old, we need to be doing volunteer work. Now, COVID's made a mess out of this because the thing that I would recommend is, okay, if you go to a church, You need to be doing a volunteer job, maybe set up the food or some other usher, whatever. It's important that you do a task on a schedule outside the home. That needs to start 
like at age 11. That's the old age that we had paper routes because I have all kinds of granddaddies come up to me and grandmoms come up to me and they find out they're on the autism spectrum and they have decent jobs, but they had paper routes when they were 11. So we've got to make a substitute for that. Okay, and COVID's made a mess out of, you know, working at the farmer's market. Uh, then they can be a little older, they can volunteer at the animal shelter. Uh, but we got to find things for them to do outside the home on a schedule. And even now they can walk dogs, they can take out trash, they can do garden work. Now we're getting into winter now. Mm-hmm. There's still things that they could do instant. They're legal. Before they graduate from high school, they need to get jobs. Now in the U.S., that's anywhere from 14 to 16 years old. You turn 14 or 16, you need to get a job so that they've learned to work before they graduate. Now we've got to be careful about the multitasking. Don't shove them on the takeout window at McDonald's. Way too much multitasking. Can't do that. Got to be careful about the multitasking. And the other thing, when I worked in construction all the time, I worked with people that are my age now. They were running businesses. I know a guy who's autistic, dyslexic, ADHD, owns an international metal fabrication company. Mm -hmm. I cannot go into what they make because it's undiagnosed, but I know autism when I see it. Mm -hmm. And he stutters too, on top of it. Yeah. So he was given that practice at a young age. Well, he was a lousy student in high school. He took a single welding class and saved him. And he started making things and showing it at little trade shows and his company grew. So you have this group of younger kids and what's the other group? That adults where, where they've even, sometimes they've graduated from college and they've never had a job. Parents forget that academic skills are totally different than work skills. So you've got a guy that's never had a job and maybe even an advanced degree. I read about a lawyer that uh, had a law degree, got fired from two law firms because he wouldn't show up on time for client meetings. Mm -hmm. You're not late to big client meetings. And he did not get the reports written. Now, I had a lot of problems, but I got my stuff written on time for the fire arrangement. And there were certain meetings I had to cover, like the Arizona Cattle Feeders, University of Arizona, Cattle Field Day. I had to cover these things. And I did that. And the other thing, I had a boss that, you know, and you saw it in the movie, they slammed the deodorant down and said, do you stink? Use it. It's okay to be eccentric. <laughs> you can't be a rude, filthy slob. Mm-hmm. That is non-negotiable. Yeah. You cannot be a rude, filthy slob. You just can't be. So let's just start with the total basics. And uh, the way to get around the interview thing, if you have a ability, like I could show drawings, I could show pictures of jobs. Somebody who's a programmer could show off some of their code and says, well, I can do Python, look at this code, or, or I do, do JavaScript, uh, look at what I made with JavaScript, and you have it on your tablet, and you show off the thing you made, and then you show the code behind it. See, that's how a techie can do an interview, or an artist can do an interview, or you can show off writing you know, for journalism. And the trick is don't put too much junk in the portfolio. Basically what you want is a 30 second wow. That's what you look at it and go, wow, that's what you want. What can employers do to be more inclusive and neurodiverse? Well, the thing with a person with autism is you cannot be vague. Um, You don't just say to them, well, do create some new programs. You're better off to say you're on this project. You have to create some code that does this. Let the the programmer do the coding, but you tell them what the outcome is. It has to be on this platform, this much memory, and get it done in 30 days from now on the 1st of January. You know, it it, it be specific. And then if the guy makes um, really bad social mistakes, don't be vague. Pull them into the office, tell them in private what they've done wrong. And I remember criticizing some welding on the first project I ever worked on. And I said, look, like pigeon doo-doo. <laughs> the plant engineer pulled me into his office and explained that that was not appropriate. And I had to apologize. What he did is he didn't yell and scream at me. He told me what I should do. You know, the boss sort of needs to look at it. It's like coaching somebody in a foreign country. It's kind of like that. And some of these people will need a quiet place to work. Open plan, super busy, crazy, noisy office is not going to work. And the multitasking is the other thing. And don't 
put long strings of verbal instructions on them. I can't rem remember sequence. I can't remember sequence. You know, write it down. Yeah. All right, Temple. So you also published a children's book in 2018 titled Calling All Minds, How to Think and Create Like an Inventor. Yes, it's all my childhood projects. This is the book right here, Calling All Minds. And when we were kids, we'd make paper snowflakes, we'd make parachutes, we'd make all build kites and airplanes and, and make things. And a lot of kids today, they don't make things. You've got a lot of kids today, they haven't made a paper airplane, they haven't made a, a paper snowflake. And when I gave a book signing for that book, several, you know, just a little over two years ago, I found out that 20 or 30% of the kids had never made a paper airplane. Wow, that's surprising. Well, I think it's just ridiculous. And so it's a whole lot of just real little things that we made in the 50s and stuff that kids did. I also have the optical illusion room in there. Mm -hmm. I've got the drawings for that in there. That's a little more, you know, more difficult project. But I also have got just very, very simple things like paper snowflakes, I, you know, just things like this. And I can hold this up for the people that are watching this on YouTube but I remember holding this paper snowflake up, you know, a simple mm -hmm. thing like that. I was talking to an educator. And this teacher said to me, in all seriousness, what happens if the child cuts it wrong and it fell apart? I said, you get another piece of printer paper. <laughs> yeah. And you try again. Mm -hmm. And maybe you go look it up on YouTube. But there's like no resourcefulness. Because I experimented and experimented and experimented with my parachutes to put spreader bars on the strings so that they open, you know, really easily. And then I went on Google patents and discovered that someone actually patents something <laughs> pretty similar to what I had made when I was like seven or eight years old. Oh, wow. So what are some of your ideas for parents and teachers who want to cultivate curiosity and imagination with their children and students? I think one of the worst things schools have done is taking out all the hands-on classes. That includes cooking, sewing, woodworking, art, theater, music, because these are things that can also turn into careers because kids just don't go make stuff. We'd get old wooden make stuff out of it. I read this wonderful article about this junkyard playground where it had tons of old tires in it and forklift pallets, you know, to just put freight on. There's all this junk out there. And they did have one adult supervising and the kids would go out there and like rip apart the forklift pallets and build stuff out of it. And now you've got kids today that are going to have a self-esteem problem because a paper snowflake fell apart because they cut it wrong. You've got to learn from your mistakes. Yeah, it's almost like they're protecting their kids from feeling like they've failed or something. Well, there's no resourcefulness. And there's a very interesting experiment that was done by a scientist named Kelly Lambert at the University of Richmond. And she had two groups of rats and she put them in great big pans. And uh, one group of rats um, got their favorite cereal, Fruit Loops, just thrown on the ground and they can just pick it up. Other group of rats, they buried the Fruit Loop cereal in piles of sawdust. The rats had to dig it out and just find it. Then, this is the interesting part, after they lived this way, where one group of rats just gets it given to them, the other group of rats had to dig in the sawdust for it. Then they give them an impossible task. She went and got a weird cat toy and put Fruit Loop cereal inside it. It was impossible for the rats to open it. She puts it in the pen. The rats just got the Fruit Loops given to them. They didn't try very hard, gave up really quickly. The rats that had had to dig for their treats they spent a lot of time trying to solve the impossible puzzle, much more resilient. And the interesting thing is when they measured the stress hormones, the rats that had been digging in the sawdust were less stressed. Oh. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, it's almost counterintuitive to what you would think. Well, that's the thing. That's the thing. And I think that's true for the kids. And I remember going to a maker show one time and they had all this electronic stuff and all these kids coming in, they could do anything they wanted. You know what the big hit was? Washing machine boxes. Hmm, why? And they had taken um, hacksaw blades and busted them in half and taped them. So even the little kids could cut that heavy cardboard. And I was a little oh. kid, I couldn't cut that heavy cardboard because yeah, I wasn't allowed to have a knife, not in the second grade. Yeah. 
and I could only cut the thin cardboard like the poster board, but you could cut up the, the big cardboard with that. That was the hit of the show. <laughs> Washing machine boxes. They don't cost anything. Mm-hmm. I'll give them to you. Well, you need more of that simple kind of stuff. Yeah, I agree. So your science teacher and mentor, Dr. Carlock, inspired you to stay curious and keep inventing. What would you say to him right now if he were alive? Well, I'm telling him that he like, got me headed into the career. He's one of the most important teachers that I had. I had some very good early teachers, very good. My speech therapist, uh, my elementary school teacher was super good. But when it came to getting me to study and get motivated and get into a career, it was Mr. Carlock because he gave me interesting projects to work on. But the thing he did that was really important, because I was a goof off bad student, didn't care about studying, was now education was a pathway to a goal of becoming a scientist. I didn't just study to make the family happy. I studied so I could become a scientist. That's a really important thing. It's a pathway to a goal. That's super important. But I've worked with skilled tradespeople that, you know, it was a shop teacher that turned them around. And there's a lot of tendency to stick their nose up at the, you know, the kids just in the trades. But, I mean, they were building big, complicated stuff. And what I've observed now is the people I've worked with that retired is that last year we opened up a big, gigantic, brand new state-of-the-art poultry processing plant. And all the equipment inside came from Holland. And that's what I call the clever engineering department. We, we know how to do the degreed engineering stuff, like the refrigeration, the boilers, make sure the roof doesn't collapse on the snow load, that kind of stuff. But the, the clever you know, machinery is coming from Europe because they've kept skilled trades. And I went through that plant and I go, whoa, this is bad. Now in beef, we still know how to make it. But when I get over there in the poultry, I was just shocked and we're losing skills. Don't stick your nose up at it. Hmm. I was just the other day reading an article about the guy that made a very big, important machined part for the Mars rover. Without those machinists, there'd be no Mars rover. They are a really important part of the team. So it's important to find what the child is interested in and kind of foster that. Well, you want to take the thing they're good at, but the thing is, if you take all the hands-on classes out of the schools, they don't have a chance to find out what they're good at. Mm-hmm. got to get exposed to something people ask me how to get involved in the cattle industry well i got exposed to it it's true for a lot of careers mm-hmm. you get interested in stuff you get exposed to or you get exposed to something so well, i really hate this i don't want to do that for a career i hate it but you don't know until you get exposed yeah so it's like not even giving people a chance yeah and you know some people inspect them really good at art some are really good at math how's a kid going to become a programmer if nobody exposes them to programming well, you've got a, a seven-year-old that's good at math. Let's start teaching them JavaScript. You start out with scratch programming. That's for real little kids. But let's say you've got a teenager, smart teenager, who's still doing scratch programming when he's 16. Uh-uh. Let's um, JavaScript, Python. I don't know how to do any of these, but I know the names of them. I know how to look <laughs> up the websites. This thing called code.org. It's a really good website. The Code Academy would be another one. There's Khan Academy. These things are free. And even if the parents don't know how to code, you can show them the websites. But if they don't know about the websites, you're not going to find out if they can code. I've had parents that were programmers. They got so hung up on the autism, they didn't think teacher kid coding. Hmm. So switching topics, Temple, in your book, Thinking in Pictures, you said, I believe there is a reason such as Autism, severe manic depression, and schizophrenia remain in our gene pool, even though there is much suffering as a result. Could you elaborate on what you meant by that? Well, in the milder forms, it gives uh, advantages. You see, a brain can be more thinking or a brain can be more social, emotional. And at what point do you slap a label on it? And even in animals, you have the animals that are more social, like the lion, for example. Let's take the cat. So the lions are much more social than the tigers and the panthers and the leopards, which are solitary. There's a crossover with autism there. Now, are leopards defective? No. You see, in the milder forms, it's just personality variation. And then what's happening is you're getting more and more kids now. Okay, he's now seven years old and he's got no friends, so he gets a label put on him. 
because at least in the U.S. you can't get any services without a label. Yeah. And then you've got somebody that's nonverbal and they have epilepsy and some other medical problems on top of autism. So you're calling this all the same name. Now, the other thing on the nonverbals, some of them can type independently and they have what's called a locked in syndrome, can't control their movements. Vision and hearing is all like the worst internet connection, but they can type independently. Mm -hmm. And so you've got this big range that have very, very different needs. Yeah. And the diagnostic criteria has been changing over the past 60 years. And I know that when you were diagnosed, your doctor described your diagnosis as a form of infantile schizophrenia and the result of cold parenting. My first diagnosis actually came from a neurologist. Okay. And it was minimal brain damage is what it was. And then they used to call autism schizophrenia. But the thing is, schizophrenia and autism are opposites. The brain opposites. That's what's known now. In autism, you tend to get too many circuits built in the back, so you get gigantic memory, but processor speed is slow. A lot of learning differences, it all gets down to processor speed. So if I'm a computer, I'm an Intel 286. You might fun to look that up online, find out what that is. Little tiny processor, but I've got the cloud, okay? I'm assuming you understand computer terminology, the cloud computing for memory. Mm -hmm. So lots of memory, little tiny processor. So attention shifting is a problem. Multitasking is a problem. Kid might be slow to respond on speech because of processor speed. You see, and that's one of the symptoms that they have. And autism is just a behavioral profile. And they keep changing it. Did somebody change the diagnosis of tuberculosis? No, they did not. You either got TV or you don't. Yeah, what do you think of the current label specifically removing Asperger's syndrome from the DSM-5? Well, I think it was a gigantic mistake from the standpoint of service providers. Gigantic, huge mistake. Because a child that has no speech delay used to be to be autistic, you had to have speech delay. Asperger's is socially awkward with no speech delay. And that's now put in with people with a lot more challenges. You see, I've been thinking about it visually. Mm -hmm. Think about it verbally. I can understand why they did what they did, but it was a mistake. I remember going to a very fancy, brand new autism school, a lot of nonverbal uh, kids there, both really young and a little bit older. And then there's a 10 or 12 year old boy, you know, fully verbal, just playing on looking at bird websites on a laptop. He shouldn't have been there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see, now that's something, it's a specific example of uh, something I absolutely don't want to see. Because I'm seeing too many kids getting held back by the label. And the thing that's interesting, when you go out to the tech companies, they avoid the label. They know they have it, but they avoid the label. Because I see too many kids where autism is becoming their entire identity. No. For me, it was always a you know, livestock editor for the farm and ranchman or a scientist. Mm -hmm. Do you identify as Asperger's? Well, I had a severe speech delay. You see, by definition, Asperger's has to have uh, no obvious speech delay. I was speech delayed till age four. Mm. Now, the thing is, it's all on a continuum. It's a true continuous trait. I've actually had my genome scanned, and I just uh, had a blood sample taken to get it scanned on the latest scanning equipment. And I found out a lot of things about my health. Like, I'm really glad I didn't do tooth implants because my jaw could have fallen apart. I found that out from it that I have a bleeding disorder, and if I get given too many blood thinners, I might die. I found that out. Very useful information. But when it comes to the autism, you've got so many different genes involved in the brain development that there's no one thing. See, the same genes that make our brain big are the same genes for autism and schizophrenia. There's a paper that's come out called Genomic Tradeoffs. Are autism and schizophrenia the steep price for a human brain? Brain development's a messy thing, and it's a true continuous trait. So you have a little less of the trait when you have Asperger's, with, okay, no speech delay, than when you have speech delay, and then you have individuals who never learn to speak, and then you get other people, multiple health problems on top of it. But it's a true continuous trait. They're not going to find, uh, because it's embedded in the genes that make the brain big, hundreds of little tiny code variations. And I'm very happy to find out that, no, I don't have very pretty teeth, but 
I'm very happy I didn't do tooth implants because having my jaw fall apart is not something that I'd like. And, I, and the genetic test showed that. That was simple genetics. It also showed why I was so anxious. That showed up. That's a simple, simpler trait. And not everybody with autism is anxious. In fact, I've seen that some of the word thinkers tend to be, some of them, less anxious. That's separate from the brain stuff. Mm -hmm. That was found out. But no, it's part of normal variation. Yeah, that kind of goes back to what you were saying about autism remaining in the gene pool for a reason. Yeah, there's a reason. Because if you took it out, you know, as I said years ago, I said, who do you think made the first stone spear? It wasn't the social yakety yaks around the campfire in the cave. Mm -hmm. This is the problem. And, that, and it's a true continuous trait. It's sort of like, you know, you breed two breeds of dog together. You can tell which is what, what mom and dad were for breed. But then you might have something, maybe it's got a quarter German shepherd, but you can still see a little bit. They mix, and a lot of those traits mix in a real continuous way. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the Mendelian traits, like, okay, in cattle, for example, you breed a black Angus uh, to a brown and white Hereford, you get a black animal with a white face. Black's dominant. That's Mendelian genetics. Real, real simple. What do you think about the future of the science of genetics and being able to potentially alter these kinds of genes that are autism related? Well, you took those genes out. Well, you better like the computer you've got now and you better like those headphones because you'll be no new ones. It's that simple. No new ones. Mm -hmm. Who do you think makes this stuff? You got visual thinkers that are autistic. You've got mathematical thinkers that are autistic. Who do you think programs the computers that this Zoom thing is running on right now? Yeah, there'd be a terrible price if you tried to take it out. Mm-hmm. You can make a brain more cognitive and thinking or make a brain more social. You see, to be really social eats up a ton of processor space in the brain, just eats it up. And so where am I going to put that computing power? Writing code or socializing? Right. And so as a society on this planet, we need everyone working together. Well, that's right. And... Oh, they're doing all kinds of stuff, you know, with genetics. Now, eventually, we'll get to the point where we can just program in genetic code. It's only four-digit computer code. It's called the DNA. Yes, it's got four ways of putting it together on each rung on the ladder. Are you excited about that or scared? Well, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, going to be a lot of issues. I don't know. I'm 73 years old. I probably will not be around for that time. If you could tell people some things to look out for ethically, what would you say? Well, there's real issues with CRISPR now. That's a gene editing method. And there's a thing called unintended edits. Okay, so let's say I want to take out, let's take a really good use of CRISPR. You can use CRISPR to modify the genetics of cattle, for example. Nobody's doing it now. I want to make it very clear. Nobody's doing it. But this is something that could be done. Okay, it's very painful for cattle to cut off their horns. So I could use CRISPR to snip out the gene that makes horns. Very easy to snip that out. And then they don't grow horns, and I don't have to cut them off. And the reason they cut them off is because they're dangerous. But the problem is, so I snip out the horn gene. There might be another piece of code somewhere in the genome of that animal that's almost the same, and it snips that out. But I don't know what it is, and I don't know what it does. That's what's called an unintended edit. That's a real serious issue. Yeah, and how will we ever know? Well, we will be able to know because we'll get enough computer power where they can just proofread the entire genome for unintended edits. That's what you'd have to do. Have to proofread. You know, on the DNA, you've got the ladders on the DNA, the rungs of the ladder. Every ladder rung would have to be proofread. You'd have to just compare one ladder to the other ladder. And there should only be one edit, the one for the horn gene, not something else. But you'd have to, you know, I think they're working on developing proofreading, but that's something that's a real issue, is that it may snip out another piece of code and you'll have absolutely no idea what it's for or where it is. But, I, you know, but this is something where, you know, nobody's um, done this yet because of the concerns about you know, genetic modification. 
but that's something that could be done for cattle because in the dairy cattle, it's hard to see some breeds of cattle. You can breed the horns off, but other breeds of cattle that then I get too narrow a gene pool. Mm. Now that's just a real simple example of genetic editing. Mm -hmm. And applied to humans. I mean, that can be, well, that's a, they had that case in China and the doctors have gotten in a lot of trouble for that. Mm -hmm. No, that's a real concern. And the biggest concern is the unintended edits. Because, see, once you do it, when they did that child, that code's going to get passed on when she has children. Right. That's uh, unintended edits is scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, this leads us into our next set of questions. We have some that were submitted by our listeners, actually. And one of our first listener questions is from Namayi Center, who is actually one of our Global Autism Project partners from Saudi Arabia. Okay. And they want to know what you think about the neurodiversity movement. Well, I think it's a good idea, you know, because the thing I'm going to be writing about in my new book is how the different minds complement. And I talked about, okay, on the video conferencing, the visual thinker is going to make the interface, the mathematician is going to make the programming. You know, the, you need different kinds of minds have complementary skills. And one thing I'm going to be discussing in the new book is, um, Jim Uhl, he's a very interesting guy, another very important mentor, helped get my career started. He'd seen some of my drawings, and he had a little tiny construction company. And he's the guy who built the project, Sean, the movie. Wonderful guy, Marine Corps captain. And what he was really good at doing, well, rather former Marine Corps captain, is putting together diverse teams mm -hmm. to, to get his company started. And he seeked me out to sell jobs and design projects. He actually headhunted me. And then he had a really conventional kind of older businessman that he consulted with. Then he hired another guy that's kind of a wild guy, but he's super good at building things. Guy that a lot of people would not have hired. That was neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. What we have to do, look at is what you can do. I love what Stephen Hawking says about disability. Right before he died, he was interviewed by the New York Times. And he said, concentrate on the things your disability does not prevent you from doing well. And he could do math in his head super well. So that's what he did. And the disability did not affect the math in the head. Yeah. What do you think about autistic people who are part of the neurodiversity movement and kind of pushing the rest of the world to change for them, like to change the environment? Well, yes, and we can do we need to have some quieter workplaces, and that's going to be a, better for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. These open offices, open plan offices. I have a client that I went and visited their corporate headquarters, and there's no cubicles, and they hate it. Open plan office. I mean, the, everybody hates it. I don't know how they get any work done in that corporate office. Yeah. Now, with COVID, they haven't been there, but I was just in there last year. It, I thought their office was awful. Mm -hmm. You know, there's certain, you know, accommodations that I think are going to be good for everybody, just like wheelchair ramps. They're really useful for pushing cargo up, you know, into the building. You know, that's a good thing. But on the other hand, I think there's some things where like being a filthy, rude, dirty slob. No, we do not have to accommodate that. Eccentric, fine. You want purple hair? Fine. Just make sure, you know, it looks nice. <laughs> there's some things where. I'm never going to be the total social butterfly. And I don't like really doing the kind of social chit chat stuff. But the thing I always, what I feel we got to do is show what we can do. And when I did those dip fat projects, the thing that motivated me is I wanted to prove that I could do it. It wasn't dumb. And when I took that job, I was at the 60% level of competence. I knew the cattle handling, but I had no idea how to do reinforced concrete walls that were in those vats. You better believe it. I got on that phone and I started calling and I got people to get me the drawings for the reinforced concrete walls. I asked for help. Big mistake that a lot of people make when they get in trouble is they don't ask for help. I asked for help to get the reinforcement rod pattern for those reinforced concrete walls. Mm -hmm. You know, there's people that go to college that are on the spectrum and they trash a course no, I failed my first math quiz. I got tutoring right away. And I had to be tutored in every math class that I was in. Asked for help the instant I had trouble. Mm -hmm. All right. Our next question is from Anne Keys. 
She's asking how you think autism awareness should be carried out in schools. Well, one of the things, my third grade teacher, one of my really good teachers, explained to the other children when I was in third grade that I had a disability that was not obvious, like wheelchairs or crutches or, or being blind, and that the other kids needed to help me, not torture me. That's actually called peer-mediated intervention, peer-mediated intervention, if you want to look it up. And I have an article I wrote online. It's called How Horses Help the Teenager with Autism Make Friends and Learn How to Work. And I actually have a little bit of literature reviewed on peer-mediated intervention. And when social mistakes are made, you need to explain to them. You can only tell that joke twice, and then you back off. You just can't keep telling the same story over and over again because people get bored with it. You need to be told that. Mm. Tell that joke twice, then that's it. So what do you think about the direction of autism awareness and inclusion today, especially given the history of how far we've come along? Well, I tend to think in specific examples. And I worked on construction sites and big, huge building projects with people on the spectrum, with dyslexics, with ADHD worked with them. They were all undiagnosed. And they were very good at what they did. I'm a big believer in, in making yourself really good at a skill other people want. Because my idea of an interview was to lay the drawing on the table. I just showed the drawings. And then you now, now you have some people on the spectrum, they're more of the verbal thinkers, and they don't have a fancy skill to show off. And when you try to teach them a job, they take longer to train. But once they're trained, they're really good. One place where people with autism are really good at quality control in spotting mistakes is a company that has all autistic people working in it, and they, they do things like test websites. Let me just give you an example of what they did. This is something as a business person, I'd want this. And this company was, couldn't figure out why one of the divisions had a 20% drop in sales. Well, the autistic guy checking a website had found that when they updated the website, they changed one digit of the phone number in that division. Oh. That cost them a pile of business. Wow. And then another job that the same company does is they, you know, you got fancy headphones like what you've got on there. Well, you got to make sure those work with every combination of devices you can think up. Mm -hmm. That's all he does is, and then finds out, well, if I, if I play Netflix and on this type of computer, then the headphones don't work. You know, it's that sort of stuff that you do. So what do you think we could be doing as a society? I think I, I'm, I'm a more bottom-up approach. You're very top-down. Let's make success stories one specific example at a time. Mm -hmm. So you've got this person doing this job. They're doing a great job. One, let's start out. People want to reform the whole education system. Let's reform one school at a time and write about it. The thing that's a problem is a lot of people that do a lot of innovative stuff don't write about their stuff. Another reason why it's important that I work for that magazine is I designed an innovative project and then I wrote about it. Writing was a very important part of my career. So you do something really innovative at a school with inclusion, write about it. Okay, we have another listener question from Autistic Rainbow 15. And they want to know what your thoughts are about applied behavior analysis or ABA therapy. Well, there's a lot of old-fashioned ABA therapy that was really terrible, and they just drove people into sensory overload. Now, the thing is, some of the modern ABA, that where they're now in, incorporating sensory stuff into it, you know, there's some good programs for getting language started. The other thing that's a problem with some of the more rigid people in ABA is they don't know when to phase it out. Hmm. I had some ABA-type things used on me but I was a little kid and it was used to get language started. And then once the language got going, then we just did 50s upbringing where everybody sat at the table. And if I put my finger in my drink, mother would say, use the spoon. She would just give the instruction. I call that teachable moment. Now, well, there's some old rigid stuff that was really, really terrible. And there's also stuff that's just stupid where you've got a fully verbal person and you're still doing ABA. I don't know, that's just stupid. Yeah, well, ABA in and of itself is just the science of learning. Well, that's right. But where there was a problem is that there were some people in ABA that didn't believe sensory problems existed, and they were driving people into sensory overload, which is going to be really painful. Good teachers don't do that. 
Yeah, and it's caused a lot of trauma for people now who are adults who had gone through it. Well, yes, and that was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. Yeah. And now, you know, people are recognizing the sensory. I was very happy to see a journal article where there had been a big meta analysis of a bunch of studies and saying that the sensory integration is an evidence based treatment. And finally, acknowledging sensory problems are real. And when I did my book, Thinking in Pictures, 25 years ago, I have a whole chapter in there where I found, you know, the reports, uh, you know, people on the spectrum had written reports. It's sensory is real. And there's now research done with brain scans that shows that loud noise sets off a big network in the brain and the fear center in the brain's lighting up like fireworks. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen in most people. So the fear circuits are getting turned on by sensory stuff. No, this might be my top research priority is therapy for sensory issues because they really can restrict life. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm a behavior analyst. I'm a BCBA. And I've seen a lot of success with little kids and even school-aged kids who are talking. We use ABA to help teach them social skills even. You know, just using the principles of learning and reinforcement to try and increase behaviors that we want to see more of. Well, if if something's working, the thing I always ask parents, I want to make sure little ones, three-year-olds, two-year-olds, four-year-olds, are getting enough hours of one-on-ones with a teacher. That I'll tell them they need to up that. They don't have enough. But, you know, they'll have that about this therapy, that therapy. I mean, the thing I have observed is good teachers just know how to do it. And I'll ask parents, is your child improving? Are you getting more speech, more skills, more turn-taking? My speech teacher did lots and lots of turn-taking games with me. So I would learn how to wait and, 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 and learn impulse control, learn how to wait and take a turn. Yeah, and I've heard you talk about the fact that growing up in the time that you did, in the community that you did, everyone was a teacher for you. That's the way it was with all the children in the neighborhood. This is just the way it was. And then when kids got to be seven years old, you'd put on your Sunday best clothes and uh, be little caterers and greeters at your parents' parties. This taught social skills. I'd go over next to our neighbor's house, and if I stirred my drink with my finger over at the Woods' house, Mrs. Wood would correct me. And she was Mrs. Wood, wasn't allowed to use her first name. But you see, grown-ups corrected kids, no matter where they were. Like I touched too much stuff in the store. The salespeople would say, don't touch it unless you're going to buy it. Mm-hmm. No, they would give the instruction. That was 50s upbringing in, in our neighborhood. You see, and that's another reason why granddaddy ended up getting a job. And most of the grandfathers I talked to would have been the Asperger type where there was no obvious speech delay. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them would have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think those styles of teaching could be applied now? Absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, we had sit down meals and these are perfect places to teach social skills. I had to learn how to take turns. I could tell about my day in school. And then my sister had to tell about her day in school. Mother would tell about what she did. My father would talk about what he did. And you take turns in conversation. That's good stuff for the families. What about the community part with everyone being on the same page? Like how can people who live in big cities practice that? Well, you can still might practice it in one little part of the big cities. My family lives in New York. So, of course, I'm not going home for Christmas this year because of um, COVID. But New York has a whole lot of little villages. You know, you kind of get a community right there on a certain block lots of times. You can create it within that community. But the other big problem is so many kids are getting addicted to video games. I was horrified when I found out that 20% or 30% of the kids had never made a paper airplane. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Okay, our next question is from David Sharif. He's interested in the moment your career really propelled and wants to know how you got to travel the world giving talks about your work. Well, it started off gradually. Well, those two, the Dipping Vat project shown in the movie was a major big thing that got my career started. And when I was asked to design that, I said, give me three weeks because I knew I had to get the drawings for the concrete reinforcement. I went through that door and I did it. It was gradual. You know, it started off, then I got invited to do a big paper for the applied 
International Society for Applied Animal Ethology in 1978. I got invited to Australia to do a talk for the Australian Lot Feeders Association. Those were two big things. And then it just kind of gradually grew. And then, of course, when the movie came out, that really increased. Then I was just traveling all the time. But I wasn't doing that all the time. But, I, you know, in the 80s, I would go and spend uh, three months on a project, two to three months on it. Hmm. And this is kind of related to the next question from Reciprocated Smile. They want to know how you keep yourself on track and motivated when you're feeling overwhelmed or burnt out. Well, I do take antidepressant medication, and that's helped me a whole lot on my anxiety. You can read all about that in Thinking in Pictures, a whole chapter about it. And I've been on the medication for 40 years. I've got no intention of stopping it. And the mistake made with antidepressants is taking too high a dose. But I had crippling anxiety. And as I went through my 20s, it got worse and worse and worse and worse. And then I remember taking the drug, and there's an old slogan for a company, better living through chemistry. and it just stopped the constant panic attacks. It also helped clear up some stress-related health problems and it helped some on some of the sensory stuff. But I want to emphasize that it doesn't work for everybody. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is way too many drugs given out to kids. Way too many, way, way too many. I was in my early thirties when I went on. My brain was all the way adult developed by that time. And I've seen a lot of visual thinkers that are very anxious. And some I think were autistic, some were not. And I'm a little bit of Prozac helped, but the mistake made is giving too high a dose and the labeled doses are often too high. And you take those labeled doses, those high doses, you'll get agitation and insomnia. It'll be a complete mess. And even though that book's 25 years old, still accurate because I keep up on all the literature on this. So Temple, what motivates you every day? Well, I figure if I can do some things where... Uh, you know, when someone just sent me a nice email saying I really inspired her to, to succeed, that makes my day. If the things I do can improve something that, um, you know, okay, we're doing this podcast right now. And if this helps somebody, and I understand we're going to a lot of different countries, and this helps somebody out there to be, you know, get a good career or helps a kid to do better in school, uh, have a better life, then I've done something of value. That's kind of how I look at it. We actually have a special thank you from one of our listeners, the Potato Witch, and they want you to know that reading your books when they were nine years old and undiagnosed helped them cope with what they were going through. Well, good. That's super good because the thing is, it's, it's been, it gives a lot of insight when you learn that the way you think is different. Yeah. And I have a book called Different Not Less. And it's uh, 16 people diagnosed later in life, mostly Asperger type, all employed, diagnosed later in life, older people. And where the diagnosis helped them was with their relationships, because now they understood why they weren't getting along with their spouse or whatever. And that's where that can be helpful. And just reading some of their stories, and I edited that book, I got insight from it too. Mm hmm all right, Temple, I'd like to close with one last question. What advice would you give to young adults with autism who are now embarking on their journeys of advocacy work? Well, I think we need to demonstrate on uh, what people can do. Like this really positive um, uh, company that's uh, Spiritech, that's the name, Spiritech. It's like testing the fancy headphones, testing websites for problems. And they're extremely good at this. The Israelis are using people with autism to analyze satellite photos. They are extremely good at this. I would really emphasize a lot of those kind of things. Let's show what you can do. This gets back to Stephen Hawking to uh, emphasize the things your disability doesn't prevent you from doing well. These are things that emphasize. Then there's the whole problem of people with very severe challenges, nonverbal, getting abused by caretakers. I'm right now doing some consulting with an agency that's working on how do we deal with them. They might be in a, uh, somewhere where their caretakers are abusing them. See, now that's a totally different kind of advocacy. And she's working on how do you advocate for somebody where they've taken away all the communication and they can't tell people they're getting abused. This is where the spectrum with the, 
word autism is on such a broad range that the type of advocacy that this person's doing is totally different than something I might talk about employment, where it's a guy that looks at satellite photos or programs computers that we're using right now. There's probably a lot of autism program the computer we're on right now. Mm-hmm. You see, this, this is the problem. And one end requires a different advocacy than the other end. So you might want to pick out which one you want to concentrate on. And I've been helping this agency to figure out how to advocate for people that can't communicate. Well, what I suggested is we have to advocate that there are people in homes that have either autism or some other very severe disability that are being abused. We have to explain to the public that that happens. Mm -hmm. And just a follow-up question on that, what advice would you give to some of these autistic young adults who now have made their identity their autism, like what you were saying before? Well, do something constructive with it. That's what I would suggest. You know, do the right kind of advocacy. Now, one thing about advocacy, I don't care if it's autism or it's in the animal field. You want to make sure that the things you advocate for do good things in the field. In other words, get out of the office and find out what's going on with people working in the field. And I'll say that for animal stuff, autism stuff, food safety stuff, I don't care what it is. Unfortunately, sometimes you've got people advocating and, you know, sitting in offices and they advocate for some law and it has an unintended bad consequence out in the field. I've seen that happen. So find out what's really going on on the front lines. It doesn't matter what it is that you're advocating. And the other thing is pick out something relatively targeted where you'll be more effective. It's sort of like someone says, well, we've got to reform the entire educational system. Well, where would you start? Let's start out. Maybe we need to demonstrate again that an art class and some hands-on classes really help the students. And then I'm going to tell them about this study, that a Nobel Prize winner was much more likely to have a creative hobby than just a regular scientist. That's an actual study. Tell people about that sort of stuff. But figure out something relatively specific, like, okay, adults with severe disabilities of various types that are getting abused. Okay, that's something relatively targeted that this agency's working on. Mm -hmm. They're not going to worry about the programmers out in Silicon Valley. And where they may need need to learn more about autism is on their marriages. That's where, where they will need it. But it's sort of like it'd be pretty hard to work on both of those at the same time. Yeah, you'd be spreading yourself too thin. You're spread so thin you can't do anything. I remember years ago seeing a charity, Save the Children Foundation, and said, don't try to save the whole world, just save a piece of it. And you donate money to one little child and you'd get letters from them. Or they're... Uh, you know, there's a smile foundation where they fix cleft palates on children that would not normally not have them fixed. You see, now it's something targeted. Doctors without borders, you know, they're doing something. You're not just all over the place. There's a tendency to get way too top down and go, oh, what are we going to do about inclusion? Well, get a little more targeted in a specific area. You will be more effective. Yeah. That's actually our model at the Global Autism Project because we partner with autism centers around the world and we work from the ground up and we train their local staff. That's right. Because if you look at it from this aerial view of we need to make sure all the kids in the world have access to services, it becomes too daunting of a task. Well, you you don't even know where to start. You see, this is the problem. Yeah. And the other thing, write about what you did. And I never wrote about it abstractly. Well, here's the drawings for the Krells. And people used to say, why do you give it away? I give it away because I wanted to make change. I wanted to make improvements. Let's say you went to a a really uh, impoverished area and you started a good school for kids that really worked and it worked really economically. Write about how you did it, how you did it with the resources in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You know, what you could do in a lot of these places um, is uh, have retired mechanics teach kids car mechanics. How did you do it in the neighborhood? And write about it and put up a website that's real information rich. I did on livestock. My autism website's got lots of information on it. And my livestock website's got information. Yes, I do sell books. 
I do do that. But I also have got lots of free information out there. And some of it's the same as what's in some of the books. I explain to people how to do things. Yeah, you're sharing your wisdom. As a visual thinker, I, I see stuff. You know, schools I thought were really terrible and some that I thought were really good. And I pick out something you can advocate about where you can see something real happening. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure and thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate you sharing your ideas with us. Well, I just, uh, I want to see people get out there and, you know, do everything that they can do and figure out how to make things better. Yeah. Oh, and the other thing I'll suggest, you want to advocate about something specific, leave the politics out of it. Hmm. You'll be a lot more effective. You got. You basically have to decide what you want to do, be a little more targeted. Yeah. Okay, Temple. Well, thank you. It's been great talking to you, and thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Knows No Borders. This conversation with Dr. Grandin left me feeling inspired, curious, and motivated. I'm inspired by her commitment to ensuring that all animals are treated with compassion at every stage of their lives. How can we apply this mindset to our fellow humans and encourage a shift from ableist views and exclusive environments? I'm curious about how fundamentally different minds can work together on various projects. How can we empower our neurodiverse colleagues to identify and advocate for their needs when working on a team? Lastly, I'm motivated by Dr. Grandin's advice to target our work and build upwards. How can we focus our efforts to create significant change? With this podcast, our aim is to transform how people relate to autism, one story at a time. We hope that by bringing you stories of breakthroughs amidst challenges and highlighting beauty in our differences, you'll feel inspired to make a difference in your own community, whether it's through a conversation with someone you know or in the way you treat your neighbor. You can watch this interview on our YouTube channel, Global Autism Project. Just a reminder to follow us on Instagram at Autism Podcast. Thanks for listening. Take care. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.